Welcome back, all of you, from Thanksgiving break. I want to begin with a, a prayer uh, somewhat humorously. I was thinking yesterday that one way to get through the rest of the semester is with humor. So this is um, an attempt to both honor the subject matter for today, which is digital mediation and liturgical practices, really, and also the beginning of Advent. And this particular prayer is from a little book I picked up a decade ago called The Book of Uncommon Prayer. Um, a compendium of prayers, rites, and readings selected especially for computer users, social media mavens, geeks, and information technology professionals. So some of the prayers are very uh, 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 tongue-in-cheek. So you have, um, for example, uh, on the day's first access to the internet, a prayer for the installation of software, um, for a uh, prayer for guidance in posting to social media sites and so on and so forth. I'm choosing the prayer to Saint Gabriel the Archangel um, because we are in the season of Advent. Uh, take the prayer with as much um, of a sense of humor as you wish. Let us pray. Blessed Saint Gabriel, Archangel, as thou didst announce to humankind the mystery of the internet, so through thy prayers may we receive the strength of wireless signals and courage to get our inboxes to zero. O loving messenger, descend upon all those for whom I wish peace and happiness. Spread your wings over all our social networks and remember us when life and connectivity are difficult. Amen. We are entering the last segment of this course and the shortest uh, dedicated to some contemporary issues as the syllabus sort of very vaguely uh, frames it. And yes, I'm aware of the fact that I'm asking you to jump across almost 500 years from where Dr. Seger left off before the break, um, with no mention in between break and now of liturgical development since then. For example, we could have uh, talked about Puritan practices of worship as they migrated into New England. Uh, we could have talked uh, about uh, the worship patterns of African American uh, peoples as they emerged out of enslavement, or the 20th century liturgical movement, or a host of contemporary issues. They all deserve attention. And the only reason for the um, smallness of the segment dedicated to contemporary issues is time constraints and um, my own sense of history also being important. So we spend uh, more time on that than on contemporary issues. I fully realize that for many of you, um, the main interest in this course might be the contemporary issues. And uh, with a bit more space, I certainly would have added a session on issues of gender as they impact and shape and have reshaped liturgical life really for the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, other issues that are important to think through uh, would be questions of interfaith worship, issues of open table communion, uh, questions of worship and disability issues, a diversity of ethnic um, approaches to worship, 
and so on and so forth. So out of the multitude of options, I've chosen two for this week to deal with, uh, and they are two that I myself have worked on, so can confidently speak about to some degree, which is the reason for choosing them, but I think they are also key issues in contemporary practice of worship. So today we focus on practices of prayer and worship in digital mediation. And uh, on Thursday, we look at issues of creation and worship. And yes, there is a book about that. Uh, well, there are many books about it now, but this one, uh, uh, the merit of this one, well, not merit, the intriguing element about this one is, don't take a picture of it, Ephraim, and this is embarrassing to, <laughs> um, to have me tout my own uh, book, uh, but, uh, for me, the interesting feature about it now is uh, that I started working on this um, before COVID ever was on the horizon. It was published in 2017. And then I was ready to um, move on to other things that I found more interesting. Well, COVID happened. And I had to spend the next year um, talking with people about how to think about liturgy and digital practices because people suddenly realized that this was important, uh, crucially important under COVID, at a point in time when I thought, oh, I found more interesting things to work on. So um, I'm happy to say that although the book is dated, my sort of basic theological convictions um, survived COVID intact and actually were proven right in, in many ways. Um, so uh, just so that you don't think I'm uh, inviting you to buy this book, you have easy access to it through the Yale system for free. And we just didn't want to add it into the reading uh, over Thanksgiving, because hopefully you had other things to do than think about class only. So. By now, of course, well, let's backtrack. I had to think about lecturing on this subject last because it was the last time I taught foundations of Christian worship um, in 2018, pre-pandemic. And I still had to do a lot of song and dance to convince people that this was really important to think through liturgical practices in digital mediation. Now I'm sitting or standing in front of people who all come with a wealth of experiences, uh, concrete experiences about that already. And um, I would love to hear uh, what those experiences have been. Um, but let's start with me offering you some input on how I have theorized, to use a grand word, um, um, approaching questions of digital mediation and liturgy. Basically, there are three, two uh, parts to this lecture, and I can post the, the outline um, in, in Canvas. I want to begin by just think, thinking through some basic um, signposts, building blocks and then attend to what probably is on people's minds most post-COVID when we think about uh, liturgy and uh, digital mediation, and it's this question of sacraments on the internet. Um, so let's begin with some signposts for theological um, reflection. When I started thinking through this subject, um, there was still a lot of misgivings in um, uh, Christian communities of faith about uh, digitality, and especially 
how it impacts our lives, but then in addition to that, how it impacts practices of faith and uh, practices of prayer and worship in particular. These misgivings, and they still exist, um, I, were typically rooted in assumptions that being online amounts to a disembodied, virtual, and therefore unreal practice. And often in a Christian narrative, um, the, the appeal is made to the incarnation. God becomes incarnate in human flesh. So um, human bodies are the basic materiality and prime media of Christian existence. And in contradistinction, digitally mediated practices seem to foster an illusion. They are virtual, after all, rather than real. A key problem, I think, with that assumption is the underlying distinction between virtual and real, and many of us have moved behind that uh, uh, by now. The term suggests, of course, that digital worlds are unreal, while offline worlds are real. You still, in sermons, will hear uh, invitations to um, and I'm not against that. Um, I just want to flag it as an example of how that dichotomy still exists. Uh, you'll be encouraged to fast from digital media or um, to encounter God in real lived life, not in the blogosphere. Or Underlying that is um, this sense that virtual is unreal, and we need to stay as Christians in the real. The distinction has, uh, has uh, become somewhat mute, I think, um, since, digital, uh, since daily living is now digitally suffused. So to, to claim that there are two spheres, the, the real that is offline and the virtual unreal that is online, I think, has, um, has become somewhat nonsensical in our daily lives. Some of you may know the app uh, uh, Pray As You Go. Um, it actually is a good example of fusing um, digitally mediated practices of prayer with whatever else you are doing, a daily commute. Uh, I can only think of other stupid examples, walking your dog and, you know. Um, so, a, uh, an invitation here to rethink the, the dichotomy between virtual and real. A second issue that, and there is no deep meaning to some of the pics, except that I had them. So don't overthink of what you see there. Uh, um, the second uh, issue is the question of virtual as disembodied. As you sometimes hear in Christian circles still that uh, digitally mediated practices are deficient because they are disembodied. And again, it's th the theological claim on which this hinges is that the Christian faith is deeply incarnational, meaning invested in bodies and matter. But in fact, when you step back and think about it, no digital world can be entered, no website accessed, no app installed without a body. It's just that digitally mediated practices do not follow traditional lines of bodily presence. But they are bodily presences nevertheless. So in digital mediation, often fingers and eyes tend to be quite busy the rest of the body may be sedentary. So the repertoire of bodily presences shifts, but it's not a disembodied presence. And uh, uh, gelling with that is the fact that some 
a worshippers report for online practices, strong bodily responses when they pray online, such as being moved uh, to tears. Um, I actually uh, had a, my own vivid uh, experience of that uh, when COVID first um, happened and uh, my parish closed its doors. You probably all remember that happening, or most of you will remember that happening to you too. Um, going on, so the, our services were live streamed. Not every parish had that tech capacity, uh, but we had. And so I went. Um, uh, to mass in my uh, living room, um, but when this the live stream first activated, and I saw my parish, my sanctuary, empty of course, but I saw it. I was able to have a sense of not being locked up alone. There was my sanctuary that I had prayed in for 15 years. I broke into tears and I thought, what the hell is going on? I mean, it's just a, the visual, but that matters. There, there are emotional reactions, meaning, yes, we have embodied reactions to uh, digital, digitally mediated practices of prayer. You all will have had your own um, experiences um, of those bodily reactions to digitally mediated um, uh, practices of prayer. Now, what is often um, identified as a problem, a specific problem of bodily presence in digital social space is that physical co-presence is absent which of course is why this became a prime medium under COVID when social distancing was the way to go. You, you create uh, liturgical practices in a medium, in a space that, that um, cuts out, eliminates physical co-presence but continues to have simultaneity. So my way of um, theorizing this is that we can, it is best to interpret ecclesial practices online and liturgical practices online on a continuum with offline liturgical practices. There are things that uh, are simply transported between offline and online, but with every change of medium, um, you also lose some possibilities while you gain others. With online practices, you lose in many ways physical co-presence but you gain other things, and we'll take a look at that briefly in a second. Uh, an additional uh, question for those who started thinking about digital media and um, ecclesial life under COVID, and let's just admit that many people didn't start thinking theologically when COVID happened, they just thought, oh, heck, what can we do? I don't have time to think this through theologically now. Nobody did. Um, well, most people didn't. Some of us get paid for thinking theologically about stuff, so that's a peculiar privilege. Um, let me stay on script here. Um, so a, a theological question, of course, could be, was for some people, how do we think of ecclesial community uh, online? And nonsensical picture again for that. Um, 
my argument has been that um, physical co-presence for the theology of the church or the doctrine of the church actually for centuries was not um, the, the key factor of how to think community unless you are a totally congregationalist uh, theologian, which isn't wrong, uh, with digital mediation, uh, it is helpful to uh, broadens one, broaden one's ecclesiology to encompass more than people who breathe the same air in the same room. And so um, I think what digital media have uh, uh, done with the practices of worship is that they have heightened the sense of the importance of simultaneity and moved down on the hierarchy of importance issues of physical co-presence, breathing the same air uh, uh, together in, in the same space. Uh, there is a media theorist, Nathan Jurgensen, whom I like, who has, um, I think, rightly um, insisted that human relationships are not predicated dominantly on, only on breathing the same air together, being in one face-to-face -face in a very literal uh, sense. I lean towards that um, thinking. Not least because the physical co-presence, if you think about worship, physical co-presence does not guarantee community. I can be in a worship service with however many other people and in my mind be elsewhere, much closer to someone on the other side of the Atlantic maybe than I am to the person praying next to me in the pews. So being in the same space alone does not guarantee a, a, a community of worshipers. That, in fact, theologically, we would have to say is the Holy Spirit only. And the Holy Spirit, we assume, isn't shackled to physical co-presence, but can work across digital media as well as other media without problems. Uh, one additional note, you can treat that as a footnote on um, the, the materiality of digital uh, social space. It was interesting for me at least, um, to see how um, worship and digital mediation, uh, especially prior to COVID, played on very traditional visuality. So this is a sanctuary from a, um, a German online uh, uh, website, a church, and they just replicated a medieval Cistercian sanctuary. Uh, why? Rather than digitally mediated images, I mean, they are digitally mediated, but it's a 12th century or 13th century uh, Cistercian monastery. Probably because of the recognition factor and familiarity factor, this looks like church to us. Well, it does to German Catholics, maybe not American uh, folks so much, but um, so a, a very traditional visuality. Now, with these sort of preparatory signposts in place, uh, let's move to the thorniest issue uh, that has emerged, uh, at least in, in COVID. A couple of footnotes to begin with. Uh, sacramental practices in digital mediation. You might think 
begin to be discussed with COVID and you would be very uh, wrong. Uh, the first uh, evidence I could find of somebody posting about a cyber Eucharist online was 1997, so that's a quarter century ago. People have been thinking about this much, much longer than a COVID, but it came, of course, to the uh, front line, so to say, uh, in 2019, 2020. As you can imagine, and probably have all uh, experienced, uh, there is a spectrum of positions on sacraments online. Um, as well as a, a cluster of very diverse um, practices when we talk about, um, it, and I'm focusing on the Eucharist in what follows. So some of the ones that were already in place before uh, COVID, Twitter communion, uh, Eucharist, Eucharistic celebrations in virtual uh, reality, think of avatars receiving communion, uh, live streamed services, of course, predated COVID, uh, and experiments with online uh, communion, particularly in the Methodist Church um, in the US, but also Great uh, Britain and other places. So a, a spectrum not only of diverse practices, but also of, oh, I'm adding dot, dot, dots, because since COVID, we have encountered a host of other options about that. Uh, a spectrum of positions, just uh, two uh, ends of the spectrum uh, to mark. There is digital denial, um, a stark uh, claim from uh, the Vatican, and I quote, there are no sacraments on the internet. You know, that settles that one, you think. Uh, the claim was made in 20. 22, so 20 years ago, um, but nothing much happens in the Vatican in 20 years. Uh, cut that out of the video, will you? <laughs> um, two, the other end of the spectrum, facile celebrations of digitally mediated uh, sacraments and not just the Eucharist, but um, uh, online baptisms, uh, you name it. And then everything in between, you've probably encountered the in between uh, in the last uh, uh, two years yourselves. Now, my approach, rather than telling you yes, uh, sacraments online are legit or no, they are not, is to say, wait a minute, the question is, the wrong question to ask at this point. Um, so what I have tried to do is to shape um, questions that I think are fundamental to coming to any thoughtful answer. And I have tried to forge questions um, in part because it seems obvious to me, at least, uh, that there is no one answer that fits all ecclesial traditions, especially when it comes to the Eucharist. Theological positions in place before you ever move online about the presence of Christ in the elements fundamentally marks how you will have to think about online practices, okay? so. If you are expecting or hoping for me to pontificate on yes, this is legitimate, or no, this is not legitimate, I cannot do that, because you all come from different ecclesial traditions. So what I can do is to highlight some questions that I think each ecclesial tradition would have to answer. Um, again, with online communion, as with uh, sacraments more generally, we have a spectrum of 
two positions uh, marked by the ends of the spectrum of two positions. The one is uh, uh, um, contra Christian sacraments are wedded to physicality and matter. Uh, again, the incarnation um, or the physicality and matter of bread and wine. So there cannot be a digitally mediated um, Eucharistic sharing and churches that argued in that uh, vein uh, ended up with two uh, positions uh, under COVID. One was to fast from Eucharist and just not have um, digitally mediated Eucharistic celebrations, but just say, okay, we don't have that option. And we aren't the first ones who never had that option. Um, I was reading again the um, account of um, uh, Catholics um, who were Jewish uh, being carted off uh, to um, concentration camps and they had priests and uh, faithful and religious huddled together. Um, they had even uh, Eucharistic elements, but they weren't allowed to to have a Eucharistic celebration. So you fast from a Eucharistic celebration. It, COVID wasn't the first example ever that visited that on the church. Uh, the other option was to, to live stream uh, Eucharistic uh, services and um, invite the faithful who celebrated in front of their screens to a form of what is called spiritual communion. Essentially inviting Jesus into their lives and hearts and bodies without the elements being partaken of. Who, who, who belonged in that camp? Who had worship services like that? A good number of people. Interesting. OK. I, so, contra, pro. These developed along two different trajectories for the most part. The first foregrounded pastoral and missional concerns. So the narrative is something like, the church is called to bring good news to all wherever they may be found. Um, people are now only able, uh, now under COVID that is, uh, to enter a sanctuary in digital mediation and to share in communion in digital mediation. So that's what we do. And many communities ended up inviting their faithful to um, set up uh, bread and wine or uh, a version of bread and a non-alcoholic drink in front of their computers and share uh, and partaking the elements together when the live, a live streamed service came to that point, okay? Yeah, I'm gonna keep that to myself. Um, the second um, theological strategy that undergirded those uh, attempts, the sort of pro approach is uh, the conviction that God's power to mediate grace is boundless. So God isn't shackled to physical co-presence, God isn't shackled to, um, uh, God's grace isn't shackled to offline realities only. Uh, God doesn't have a problem with being present through and in uh, a digital mediation. Who sort of uh, experienced that reality of, okay, some people, okay. There is, of course, a, a way, so I'm now going to the footnote that I thought I'd save myself, but it's, uh, 
we shouldn't think too narrowly here. Um, even communities that invited people into spiritual communion only. I don't see why having in front of your computer screen uh, a bread and wine to, to deepen the visuality of the elements it uh, couldn't be a possible um, approach even if you leave open the question as to whether through digital mediation this becomes the body and blood of Christ. Okay, that's sort of um, theological gymnastics uh, to the nth degree, but now, oops, sorry, I should have uh, uh, pressed that button sooner. Some thoughts on COVID. I need to watch the time also, okay. And you can put this under nonsensical uh, images. But I wanted to flag at least a book that recently uh, came out that actually reflects on practices of Holy Communion um, under COVID and maps the diversity of those. It's a, a British uh, Church of England theologian and it's slanted towards that. Uh, but that doesn't make it wrong. It, it's just um, the peculiar constraints of that book. There is interesting stuff in there if you want to read more deeply into uh, what was actually done, how people rationalized uh, what they were doing, uh, and so on and so forth. I want to come to questions that I think, rather than answers, that I think are worth asking as we continue uh, thinking about uh, um, practices of worship and particular uh, sacraments in digital mediation. Because this is not going away, whether uh, COVID might go away or we begin to live with it, but digital mediation is on the, uh, on the rise and it's not going to stop uh, uh, shaping uh, practices of worship just because COVID has uh, become more manageable. Um, I have some startling statistics somewhere. So, um, it's especially with um, artificial intelligence on the ascendancy, and I'm not even going to uh, touch that, but we are seeing more and more uh, sophisticated versions of digital technology. And if you want just one uh, figure, the global spending on augmented and virtual reality technologies is, I think, now around $15 billion. So there is a vast economic interest in, in the growth of these technologies. Now, some questions I think are worth asking. Uh, and. I have three categories, looking back, looking into the present, looking into the future. Uh, the first question that I find intriguing is, uh, rather than pretending that this is totally new and has never happened before digital mediation, that is, to wonder, are there sacramental bits and pieces in the church's tradition that can be brought into dialogue with digital bits and bytes? And there are <laughs> uh, quite a number of interesting uh, uh, things. Let me name just uh, one of them. Um, some medieval theologians, some of you will know this, uh, wondered uh, theologically about 
what if the famous mouse would eat that nibbles on consecrated elements. This is not a joke. I mean, mice were omnipresent, and they did eat uh, uh, hosts. So then the theological question, but there is a deeper theological question there about the presence of Christ. So medieval theologians came up with a complicated way of thinking about how the body of Christ uh, could be eaten sacramentally, spiritually, by desire only, and then physically only, which is what the mouse does. And it doesn't really eat the body and blood of Christ. But one could take some of these um, ways of thinking about the reality of Christ in the, uh, um, in the elements and think about what happens when we add digital mediation into these various ways of consuming the body of Christ. Anyway, that's, I'm not asking any of you to dig up medieval theological um, uh, thinking for contemporary issues. All I want to do is say, we are not the first to have to think about complicated questions of what happens in, uh, in Eucharistic eating. More could be said. Questions that emerge from today, I think, that I find important is what exactly is the key problem when we think about particularly the Eucharist in digital mediation? Is it physical proximity? It cannot really be uh, because there is more to being church and the body of Christ than physical proximity. Is it the question of matter? So the fact that in digital mediation, people do not share the same matter. If that's the key problem, can there be a digital equivalent uh, for matter in cyberspace? What might it be? Electricity, connectivity, I don't know. Okay, for future theological work, I would find, I find interesting to think through where sacramental grace can be located in a mixed reality world, in a world that does no longer live only offline, but has created uh, multi-sites and mixed realities. And the question of whether sacraments or sacramental grace always have to be shackled to physical proximity. Can the anointing of the sick happen in digital mediation? Can confession of sins and absolution happen in digital mediation? I think that's the easiest one, actually. Um, can the celebration of the Eucharist and sharing in the Eucharistic elements, that's what it really is, the crux. It's not can you participate in a Eucharistic celebration by watching a presider consecrate elements online. Of course you can. How you might be able to share in the elements is the crux of the issue. And that's the end of the slideshow. I want to end on a piece of good news and then open up for discussion. I hope I've left enough time. Yes. I think the element that for me is good news w when reflecting on the world of digitally mediated sacramental practices 
is that the reach of God's grace is not the problem here. God and God's grace, although committed to the sacraments, can never be reduced to them and can also not be shackled to physical co-presence. And the Christian tradition has always in pockets acknowledge that. Think of um, this notion of a baptism by desire. In other words, you are in a situation where there is no water, no person to baptize you. The sheer desire for baptism as you face death, let's say, affects baptismal grace. The church has maintained. So there are, there, there can be, long before digital mediation came around, we had ways of thinking about sacramental grace that wasn't shackled to materiality or shackled to physical co-presence. So that's good news. Um, for me, that means that the key question with regard to sacramental practices in digital mediation is not at heart theological in the narrow sense of the word. We do not need to ask whether God can be present and active online. The, the answer is simply, of course. But that also doesn't give us then liberty to, um, to sort of um, m m practice a garden hose approach to, uh, to grace. You know, the person who thinks they can baptize with a garden hose and it just covers everything. I'm making this up as I go along. Um, the notion of God's omnipotence it is not an invitation to authorize just anything you want. The key question, I think, in the digital age may well be how are we, the faithful, that is, present to God in digital social space? And how are we, the faithful, present to God's grace, including forms of sacramental grace, in this space? <laughs>